Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves accomplishes one big thing. Even after two watches, I still want to like it, which at the very least means it wasn't as offensively bad as any recent Marvel film. But it faced two significant problems from the outset and hadn't overcome either of them by the close of the film. Of the first problem, Dungeons and Dragons' lingering popularity isn't in the stories that it has told across various media, it's the framework it established to allow other people to tell their own stories. Honor Among Thieves thus isn't just competing with other cinematic releases, it's also competing with any given game you yourself have played or any story you yourself have constructed. Ah, but you might be thinking, the last time I played it I was drunk and high and our quest was to reclaim the butt plug of hope from the rectum sanctum of Xanathar. Surely well-paid Hollywood scriptwriters who are hired because they are professional writers can do a better job after several years of development than me and stoned Dave managed in an afternoon in our college dorm. Well, yes, you might well think that, but if you do think that, I can only assume you haven't been to the cinema recently. The second problem stems from the actual writers of Honor Among Thieves and their estimation of the genre they're writing for. They're on record as saying that fantasy generally is too arch, too epic, too dark, and too serious. Among their goals with this film is to create fun fantasy, fantasy that doesn't take itself too seriously, that can poke fun at itself, that can tell meta jokes. Which strikes me as precisely the wrong way about. The question isn't why is high fantasy so serious, it's why is serious fantasy so popular, to which the answer might well be, at least in part, because it is serious. It appeals to an audience tired of being treated like idiot children whenever they sit down to witness the results of a big budget production. If your answer to epic fantasy's severity problem is to treat epic fantasy like a Marvel film, you have perhaps misidentified the problem to begin with. None of which is to say that Honor Among Thieves is a total failure. It depends on your comparator. If your comparator is other recent films, Dungeons & Dragons probably is a cut above the last few years of MCU productions. Its humor isn't as insufferable. The writing, in particular the character and world building, is better than, say, Multiverse of Madness or Ant-Man 3. The plot makes a bit more sense than all of that bilge. But if your comparator is good films from Days Yore, or even great Dungeons & Dragons games I've personally played, Honor Among Thieves falls short. At its best, it is mildly entertaining, though too often it leverages its light-hearted quips against the emotional impact of its plot. The plot itself is almost comically simple. Go here to find the thing you need to rescue the damsel and beat the evil wizard. That simplicity does have merits. The fewer plates you juggle, the fewer you're able to drop, and the more complete the plate-spinning performance looks. But it also has its drawbacks, especially given the vast wealth of lore and, next to the almost limitless imagination of decades of players, to reduce this world and this history to such a restrictive, rankly unimaginative story amounts to a horrifying waste of potential. Honor Among Thieves takes so few risks, it's so afraid to fail, that it's denied itself any shot at true success. Which is ironic, given what passes for the film's moral message hinges on failure. Our ragtag cast of heroes are all failures, they all fail repeatedly, they fail significantly in the course of the film, only for Captain Kirk himself to rally them back to the cause with a play on Winston Churchill's old line, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it's the courage to continue that counts. It actually forms one of the film's strongest scenes, one of the rare moments when it allows its characters the time to be somber and serious without wrecking the tone with an ill-advised quip. It's just a shame the writers didn't take their own moral lesson to heart. Not that it's all bad, of course. The simplistic plot does, as I say, have its merits, and the character work does too. Each of the four principal members of the party not only has a chance to demonstrate their class-specific skills, which is a bit of Dungeons & Dragons-style storytelling that other bigger films ought really to have learned from by now, but they're also given their own arcs. The overarching plot, of course, establishes motive, flaw, setback, and payoff for the group, but within that group are four mirroring sub-arcs for each of the party members. Tragic beginning, personality flaw, setback, challenge overcome. Granted, these are not much more complex than the story of which they're a part. Poor wizard racked with self-doubt finds new belief in self-worth. Forest girl lost her people, has trust issues, overcomes them. Brutish warrior exiled from tribe struggles to find her place, then finds a new family, and so on. But simple though these things are, the presence of these personal journeys at least lends the impression that these are characters who belong in the world, that there are ideas the writers have about them, they are supposed to be in the story, none of them are mere passengers. There's also some fairly decent juxtaposing work, done between our hero, Captain Kirk, and our villain, Hugh Grant, faintly dashing and roguish and probably my favourite character. 
The film wants to play up greed as a motive, but it does have a surprisingly nuanced understanding of how greed expresses itself, passing it as a conflict over fatherhood and what it means to be a parent, an expression of love for another, something self-sacrificial, or a vanity mirror, something self-aggrandizing. It doesn't strike this perfectly, of course, it doesn't hold it consistently, and besides letting down the potential of the source material, one of the bigger disappointments is that the usually solid character work does fall, when fall it does, around our nominal main character, Captain Kirk, his motives and his relationships. It's disappointing because these are the things that are supposed to drive the story, and yet they're also the things the writers seem the least sure about. The writers can't seem to decide, for example, whether Kirk's avarice is material or personal. They introduce a want for money when that's convenient to them, but then they subordinate the want for money to greed of an entirely different and more nebulous sort when that's more convenient to them. As a result, we can't quite work out what his highest motive is, family or money. On top of all this, of course, the film evidently has some of its mind on the potential for a sequel, but unfortunately, it arraigns this want against the point of its own story. You could have told quite a simple and compelling tale focusing on loss and parenthood, trust and betrayal, greed and sacrifice, all of which is present in the film, and played the majority of it through the conflict between Captain Kirk and Hugh Grant, resolving the film with the resolution of their personal battle. That would account for the film's strongest material and the most well-realized dynamic between hero and villain. But over and above all of that, Under Among Thieves places a layer of what can only be described as generic fantasy shite. A sinister, bigger, magical evil that plots for world domination because... Because because it's evil, I guess? That, that's what evil things do? They want to dominate the world and kill everything? Because, yeah, because villainy. Because the film is so scared to fail, it doesn't trust itself to hold very much back either, meaning that what ought to have been the culmination of the battle between Kirk and Grant is then superseded by a distinctly Marvel-ish fight against the big bad sorceress, who doubles as a walking advert for Minoxidil. This both distracts and detracts from a much more personal story, and probably makes the film seem more generic than it otherwise might, and it otherwise might have felt only quite generic. The final battle sequence isn't value-free, of course. It shows how our heroes now work together as a party, it shows the culmination of their individual and their collective arcs, but that's more of a repeated beat than something original. It's not something the film hadn't already at least implied and partially shown. It's not the only example, either, of the film's poor genre work, undercutting what's good about its character work, though it is probably the most egregious one. In the ideal world, you would have focused on the conflict between Captain Kirk and Hugh Grant, and maybe, yeah, maybe Hugh Grant could be talking to some sinister shadowy force, but we wouldn't need to see it in this film, because that would be a distraction. All in all, Honor Among Thieves, um, well, it exists, so there's that to be said for it. Its biggest crime is that it turns something so rich into something so generic which I suppose means that it's generic is logically the worst thing you can say about it. That automatically makes it better than much else that's out at the cinema at the moment. But, and like the points of genuine praise I've tried to mention, these are all comparative merits. I don't personally subscribe to the view that quality is purely relative. The idea that a film is good merely by being better than that other crap. By comparison, the film's strongest moments, chiefly its character work, are really quite good, but on their own terms, or compared to a better time, when well-paid script writers knew a thing or two about writing scripts, these triumphs seem utterly unremarkable. They barely even count as triumphs. At its best, then, Honor Among Thieves passes only the most basic of tests. It achieves nothing much save, perhaps, avoiding the cesspit into which recent big-budget productions have fallen. It's not especially memorable for good or for ill. It is, in conclusion, quite aggressively mid, and you could find a much greater adventure on your tabletop.